Uh, now let's get, uh, let's get into God's Word today. So we're in a new message series. We started last week. It's called Yes and Amen. And what we're doing is we're talking about the promises of God. There's promises of God throughout the Bible. God promises things to his people. And a lot of times what happens with these promises is we doubt them or we're not sure that God will deliver on them. And that's the wrong response. And so throughout this series, what I'm trying to encourage all of us to say and do to the promises of God is to say yes and amen. Yes, Lord, we want that. Yes, Lord, we accept that. Yes, Lord, we receive that. And, and amen, or so be it, let it be. When people say amen, they mean let it be. I agree with that. Praise the Lord, right? So we're saying yes and amen to the promises of God, accepting them, uh, being grateful for them, celebrating them. And so last week we talked about this promise of new life. That is, as a follower of Christ, God says he will put a new heart and a new spirit within us, that we become a new creation. And that's awesome. And we believe that that happens not by our own doing, but it happens, as God's Word said last week, in Christ. It's in Christ. It's by Christ. It's through Christ that this new life can begin. And so we celebrate, and we need to accept that promise, because there's many people who claim to be followers of Christ, but they're still living their old life. They claim to be changed by the grace of God, but they're still living the way that they always lived. They're not embracing this new life that they have in Jesus Christ. And so that was last week. If you missed it, you can go back on our, our website or our Facebook page and you can check that out. This week we're going to look at another promise, a promise that oftentimes we don't accept, oftentimes we don't receive, and the promise is this. It's the promise of answered prayers. The promise of answered prayers. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 11. That's where we're going to start off today. Inside of your bulletin, there's also a page in there. There's a couple inserts, and we'll talk about those later. Uh, but the, the one that I want to pay attention to first is this. It's uh, one, it's got prayer requests on one side, so that's fitting since that's what we're talking about today. Uh, but on the other side, it's got a place for message notes. And so if you want to uh, jot anything down, anything, a verse or scripture or a thought stands out to you, you want to write that down. If you have some action steps or something you want to do in a result, as a result of what God's Word uh, teaches you today, then you can put that down. I encourage you to do that too. Mark 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 22 is where we're going to start today. All right. Here's what God's Word says. Uh, let me, oh, I forgot I have to preface this. So this is a, kind of a funny story. This is a great text, but it has a kind of a lead up to it that I need to explain. So like the day before this, uh, this story we're about to read, they are disciples and Jesus were walking down the road and Jesus was hungry because he was a, a man, right? He was, he was all man, all God. He was hungry. And so he saw this fig tree off in the distance and it had leaves on it. And, and so he went over to the fig tree and he thought, I'm going to get me some figs and that'll be great. But he goes up to this tree. It's got all leaves. It's got no figs. And so Jesus got a little frustrated, it seems, with this tree. And he says, may you never bear fruit. Nobody's ever going to eat from you again. And then they walk off and, and probably go get something to eat. Well, the next day they come back by and the disciples are like, oh man, that, that tree that, that Jesus talked to is dead. Like it's dried up and it's gone. And they were really amazed that Jesus talked to this tree and it, and it died. It was like, you know, it was a, kind of a simple act of his power, but to them it was amazing. And so Jesus responds to them here in verse 22. And he goes on to explain the power of prayer. And that's why we're here in this verse today. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. And Jesus used this mountain illustration because this was a way to say the impossible is possible, right? You look at a mountain, you think about moving that. No, can't do it. It's impossible. Jesus is saying the impossible is possible. What? With faith in God, verse 22. So going on, verse 24, he says, therefore I tell you, Whatever you ask in prayer, believe it. Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. And if you have any, anything against anyone, so that your Father, uh, I'm sorry, and whenever you stand praying, forgive. For if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father will also uh, forgive your trespasses. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll dig into this a little bit more today. 
God, thank you for your, your word. Thank you for scripture. Thank you that we can read it and learn from it and know you more from it. Lord, and I just pray, God, that you would help us today. Uh, as I pray to you, I'm praying, Lord, that you would help us to be a praying people, that you would help us to be a people that connect with you through prayer daily, that, Father, we uh, desire to know you more, and so we communicate with you more, and, Lord, that you would speak to us as well, and we would do your work and your will for your glory in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. So we recently did a survey at our church. Uh, you, many of you maybe know that. Uh, and we did a survey. It was kind of like a church-wide thing. We had 52 people that filled it out. Uh, and so we filled out this survey. Many of you did it. Uh, and, and a couple questions about prayer were on this survey. And I just want to point to them real quick and kind of celebrate some good things. Uh, one of them was this. Uh, one of the statements was, I believe that the Bible teaches that prayer should be a daily part of every Christian's life. And so you could strongly agree or agree or be undecided or disagree or strongly disagree. And everybody that took the survey, 100% of people, either agreed or strongly agreed that they believe prayer should be a part of a Christian's life every single day. And that's a good thing, right? That's a great thing. So we believe that prayer is important. And then one of the other questions that, that really got amazing answers was this. I believe that prayer works, okay? 50 out of 52, 96% said, agreed or strongly agree, I believe that prayer works. And then, and then two were undecided, but so almost everybody said, I believe that prayer works. And so I looked at these questions and I thought to myself, what does this say about our church? Well, it says, it says two things, right? It says, we believe that the Christian should pray, right? And then it says, I believe that God answers prayers. I believe that prayer does something. I believe that it makes a difference. I believe in these two things. So with all that being said, why don't we pray more? Why don't we pray more? If we believe that we should and we know that it makes a difference, why don't we pray more? That's where I want to start off today. Haven't you noticed that it's easier to talk to other people than it is to talk to God? I remember um, back like when I was in college or even maybe newly married, whenever uh, I would have something happen during the day that was frustrating or hard or I was going through something, I would always think, I'm going to call my mom, right? I'm a mama's boy, all right? Leave me alone. I would say, I'm going to call my mom. And so I would call my mom and I would talk to my mom. And then one of the days it hit me, I was, I was driving home and I thought, what if I was as eager to talk to God as I was to call my mom? I called my mom because I had a problem. I wanted my mom's advice. I wanted her help. I wanted, you know, I wanted my mom to pat me on the back, tell me it's going to be all right, right? I wanted all those responses from my mom. But one day I was convicted. It hit me. Why don't, why don't I take it first to God? And so I, I tried to start developing this habit in that moment and that day where, and when I had that, that, that desire to call my mommy, right, I would say, let, instead, let me call my father. Let, let me talk to my heavenly father. But there's something that's demonstrated there in that simple little silly story is that it's easier for us to talk to other people than it is to talk to God. It's more natural for us to say, let me tell you what's going on. Let me share my problems with you. Let me get your advice. Maybe you can help me. We want to share with other people. It's easier for us to do that than it is to talk to God. It's also easier for us uh, to be active, to be about good work, to check off the boxes of our daily Christian to-do list than it is to take time to pray. But as Martin Luther once said about 500 years ago, and it's still true today even though his illustration is a little bit dated, he said, as it is the business of tailors to make clothes and cobblers to mend shoes, so it is the business of Christians to pray. What is a tailor if they don't make clothes? They're not a very good tailor, right? right? What is a cobbler if they don't mend shoes? And you're like, what is a cobbler? Let's stop right there. Right? What is a cobbler if they don't mend shoes? They're not a, not a very good cobbler, right? What is a Christian? if he or she doesn't pray. To pray is an admission. It's an expression of our hearts 
of our dependence on God. And isn't that what being a follower of Christ is? Being somebody who realizes, recognizes that I am, need to be fully dependent on the grace of God, the strength of God, the peace of God, the wisdom of God and the love of God. I am dependent fully and wholly on those things. I want to talk to you guys today about a couple, few reasons that we don't pray, and then I want to jump back into the scripture we read earlier and talk about why maybe some of our answers to our prayers don't come when we want them to. The first reason I think that we, we don't pray is we don't pray because we don't make time. We don't pray because we don't make time. Michael Reeves, in, in his book on prayer, said this. He said, instead of chasing the idol of our own productivity, let us be dependent children. And he's playing on this idea, this concept that we are children of God, that he is our heavenly father, and we should communicate with our, our heavenly father as we communicate with our biological or parents here. And so he says, let us be dependent children, and check this out, and let the busyness that could keep us from prayer drive us to prayer. I think we could all admit busyness keeps us from prayer, right? We get busy, things get chaotic, we have a schedule, an itinerary, a to-do list, we got all these things and we're running and gunning and we're moving all day long and the one thing that we forget to do, I'll do it later, I'll make time for it then, we forget to pray. But what he says here is, let's take the busyness, the chaos of life, and instead of using that as an excuse not to pray, let us make that a reason to pray. Lord, I have so much going on that I need to pray. I need your hand in all that I do today, Lord. So we go to the Lord, and our busyness is a signal then to us that it's time to slow down, it's time to pray. We remember to pray like we remember anything else in our life. Right? We write it down, we put it into our schedule. We make a habit or a routine out of it. Anybody forget to brush their teeth this morning? If you, did, if, if you didn't, just look to your neighbor and say, no. All right, real long, draw it out. No, we didn't. We, I, I didn't. We didn't forget to brush our teeth this morning, right? Anybody forget to have breakfast this morning? Maybe, if, maybe a few of us did that. We got, we got busy. We cut that out. Uh, but we don't forget these things. You probably have socks on, right? You probably have underwear. You probably have all these things on. You've done that. Why? Because you made time for it. You know that it's so important to have socks on. It's so important to brush my teeth. It's so important to eat breakfast that I'm not going to leave the house this morning without doing it. Prayer needs to be even more so important to us, to our lives as followers of Christ. I can't leave the house without at first taking time to speak to my heavenly Father. Oftentimes we look at prayer and we say, man, that's a, maybe that's a waste of time. But we need to view prayer as something that's more important than time. It's more important than anything else we have going on. We have to make time to pray. Another reason we don't pray is this. We don't pray because we get too comfortable. We get too comfortable in our life. Whenever we get too comfortable, things get going good in our life. We're like feeling like we're on cruise control finally, right? Maybe we've been in a traffic jam for months, but we're finally on cruise control on the highway. Things are going well. We get comfortable and prayerlessness sets in because we don't have something driving us to prayer. We feel like we've got the world under control. We feel like we've got life handled, and when we feel like we've got life handled, we forget about the hands that hold the world, and we forget to pray. But instead, I want to encourage you that we should let the comfort that could keep us from prayer drive us to prayer, right? When life gets great and things are awesome, praise the Lord for those times, those seasons in our life when we don't feel like everything's falling apart because Lord knows there are seasons in our life where we do feel like everything's falling apart. But in those times, we should still pray. Our prayers might change a little bit. Our prayers might be more thanks and praise the Lord than they are request and supplication. But the fact that we pray should not change. Maybe our prayers change, but the fact that we pray does not change. And so we got to let our comfort, those times where we're sitting back and we're thinking, man, life is good. 
be a signal to us. Well, praise the Lord that life is good right now. Praise the Lord that things are well right now. Thanks to the Lord I have food in my belly and shoes on my feet and a roof over my head and my car's not giving me trouble right now and all these things. Praise the Lord for that. We need to make time to thank him for that. The last reason that I want to share with you today, and of course there's several more, that we don't pray is this. We don't pray because we doubt it will change anything. We doubt it will change anything. Pastor John Piper said this. He said, one reason we don't pray is because we believe Satan's lie that prayer does nothing. But that's not what Jesus taught. Jesus promises that every time we pray, God will answer. He will either do exactly what we ask or something even better, which he would not have done had we not prayed. It's a deep thought. Prayer involves communication in the spiritual realm. Many of our prayers are answered in ways that maybe we won't see here in this material world, in the material realm. Many prayers are answered in different ways, better ways, than we would have anticipated or thought to have even asked. But our prayers are indeed answered. But oftentimes we don't pray because we doubt that. We doubt that the Lord will answer our prayer. We doubt that he will do what we have asked or petitioned of him. And because we doubt that, we begin to worry about that. When we doubt, we start to worry about. We worry about everything. When we doubt that God can take care of it, we feel like it's up to us to take care of it. And when we feel like it's up to us to take care of it, like everything is dependent on us, we do what comes natural. We worry. How am I going to do this? How will this ever get right? How can I ever fix this marriage? How can I ever raise my kids? How can I ever make enough money to do this or to do that? We worry, we worry, we worry. Imagine with me today, if I could sell you or give you, I would just give it to you, like a, a, a prayer sensor. So like, in your life, ever so often, it would just kind of notify you, like a, like a notification on your phone, you know what I mean? It would just kind of like go off every once in a while and say, hey, it's, it's time to pray. It'd be a good time to pray right now. And it just kind of would sense in your life times, periods where it would be good to pray. Like, that would be cool, right, to have that. Like, I, would, I could use that every so often to have this sensor in my life that would sense when it was a good time to pray and let me know, hey, Jeff, right now, stop, pause. It's a good time to pray. That'd be pretty cool, right? Uh, what if I told you that your body, right, your mind, comes with one of those built in. It's called worry. It's called worry. When we get to that point where we, we begin to worry about something, that is our prayer sensor acting up and telling us, listen, it's time to pray. Like, you need to take this to the, to the Lord. You're trying to carry this burden. You're trying to carry this load on your own. And what you need to do right now is you need to offload that. You need to take that off your shoulders and give it to the Lord of all the universe. Because it's not too big for him, but it is too big for you. So all of us have this built-in prayer sensor letting us know all the time when we're worried, when we're anxious, when we're uh, caught up with all life and it's feeling, we're feeling overwhelmed. This is a reminder for us. It's a blessing that we could have these moments, that we could go at these times to the Lord and pray. I struggle with worry from time to time. I feel like i got to figure everything out on my own. And it's burdensome, overwhelming. It's more than I can bear. And it's okay, because I don't have to bear it. The Lord wants to help us. He wants to guide us. And this worry is a reminder to us that whenever we worry, we should start to pray. Psalms, uh, Philippians 4, 6, one of my favorite verses about prayer and the Bible, uh, Philippians chapter 4 is just such a rock-solid chapter of the Bible. I encourage you to go home and memorize that. It's been, it's been my goal is memorizing Philippians 4 lately. I've been reading it uh, multiple times a day because I have it posted in my bathroom. And uh, so I read this scripture all the time, and, and I, I just try to set my mind on it. And one of my favorite parts right here in verse 6, listen, look at this. Do not be anxious about anything, Paul says. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, 
Let your requests be made known to God. Listen, God's word tells us that he wants us to bring our requests to him. The devil will, will try to convince you that, that God won't answer it, that he won't do anything. He'll try to convince you that he's too busy or he's got better things going on or it's not worth his time. These are all lies. The Lord wants to hear from you. Like he desires to hear from you. He wants you to bring your requests to him. You're not bothering him. We worry about that all the time. Oh, I'd ask them to help me out. We talk about that all the time with, with a babysitter or something. We need a babysitter. Like, I'd hate to bother them. Like, I, it's late notice. Uh, it's, it's a longer time. I just would hate to bother them and ask them. Whenever we ask people a favor, we don't want to bother them. Like, you're not bothering God, right? He's not bothered by your requests and your supplications. He's not bothered. He desires to hear from you. He wants to know that you believe in him and you trust in him enough that you would bring what matters most in your life to him. And so he calls. He says, bring it to me. And so what I want to encourage us to do is to let the worry that oftentimes keeps us from prayer drive us to prayer. Let it drive us to prayer. What if we took this natural, seemingly evil feeling of worry and we used it to connect us with the supernatural God of all the universe? What if we use this totally natural thing to connect us with the supernatural? Don't you think it would be powerful if we spent less time worrying and we spent more time praying? If every time we began to worry, we would stop, we would pause, and we would pray. Don't you think it would make a difference? It would make a difference in our lives. It would make a difference in not only us, but it would make a difference in the circumstances that surround us. It would make a difference if we spent time to pray. And why would it do that? Well, as E.M. Bounds once said, prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Isn't that just a beautiful picture? When we pray, our prayers move the hand that moves the world. Prayer makes a difference, church. Prayer does things, church. Thank you. There we go. That's what I was going for. Prayer does things. Prayer changes circumstances in our life. Prayer can mend relationships in your life. It can heal physical issues in your life. Prayer can meet financial needs in your life. Prayer can fix what is broken. Prayer, and most importantly, the one who we are praying to can handle any difficulty or any problem that we have going on in our life. Prayer makes a difference. J.C. Ryle said this. He said, it seems that nothing is too great or too difficult when it comes to to prayer. Prayer achieves things that otherwise that would otherwise be completely impossible and out of reach. How many things have not occurred? How many souls have not been saved? How many, how many uh, uh, missions have not been started? How many people have not been healed? How much has not happened because we have lacked the faith to pray? But our prayers move the hands that move the world. Our prayer achieves things that would otherwise be completely impossible and out of reach. So we need not be scared to pray or hesitant to pray, but we should be eager to pray, eager to take things to the Lord. Because when we pray, God works. When I work, I work. And that happens, right? But when I pray, God works. God does his thing. And when we pray, we invite God and his infinite power into our life, into our world, to act on our behalf. That's a big invitation to a big God. And so when I think about it like that, I'm just really not sure why I fail to ask him so much. Now I want to look at a, a couple passages of Scripture. The first is the one that we looked at earlier today as we began. It's Mark 11, 22 through 25. <clears throat> This is a promise from Jesus Christ himself in Scripture that he'll answer our prayers. 
So once again, Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart and believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. I want to really focus on verses 24 and 25 right there. So if you, if you have those in your Bible, I'd, I'd highlight them or maybe put a star next to them. Remind yourself that those are important. Uh, I want to look at verse 24 first here. What does he say? He says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. A couple keys. Jesus hides a couple keys to having our prayers answered in this text. And the first one is this, verse 24, that we have to believe and do not doubt. We have to believe and not doubt. In the book of James, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, it also tells us this. It tells us that, that we are going to pray, but we must pray with faith. We must believe that God is able. We must go to him and expect to receive what we have prayed because we know that he is capable. God rewards our faith. Oftentimes in the Bible, Jesus is walking around and somebody needs to be healed and he heals them. And what does he say to him? Your faith has healed you. I mean, Jesus healed them, but your faith, their faith was key to Jesus healing them. We gotta have faith. We gotta believe that God is who he says he is, that he's done what he's promised he's gonna do and he's gonna do what he's promised to do. We gotta believe these things about God. We gotta have faith in him. And I believe that my prayer life is strengthened when I spend time inside of God's word. When I look at God's word and I read about like that verse in Philippians chapter four, that God wants to hear my prayers. Uh, when I read this verse here in Mark 11, that, that God wants to answer my prayers. Like it strengthens my prayer life. When I look at the, the stories and the illustrations that Jesus gives and has where he has answered prayers, where he's done things in people's lives, it tells me, it fires me up. It says, that's possible. What Jesus had done is possible to be done today. I must have faith. I must be a person of faith. And when I read these things, I am glad. And I'm encouraged to pray. And I believe that he answers. But the first thing that we got to do is we got to believe and we got to not doubt that God is faithful, that God can answer our prayers, church. I think about the story I, I told you as I began today. I think about Abby. I think about her, her little baby that's in this world now and what a blessing that is. And I just... I believe that the Lord answered prayers. And you can credit it to whatever you want to credit it to. I'm going to credit it to God. I'm thankful for the doctors. I'm thankful for all those who helped. But I believe that God had a hand in it. And I believe that. The second thing, the second nugget that Jesus hides in here is found in verse 25. Jesus says, and whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. So we got to believe and not doubt, but we also need to make sure that we don't ask with sin in our heart. Some of us bearing bitterness and, uh, and hate, frustration with other people, people that we're, we're carrying around these burdens all the time. Uh, some of us just living in unrepentant sin. Doing things that we know are, are not God's best for us. We know they're not God's plan for us. They're sin, but we're continuing to do it and indulge in it, and we don't care. And you expect God to answer those prayers? You expect God to hear your prayers? Jesus says it's important that we forgive those we have hurt. Uh, if you look all the way back to the book of Psalms, chapter 66, David says, if we cherish sin... If we cherish it, we love it, we embrace it, we're cherishing sin, then the Lord won't listen. Church, we need to, to purify ourselves, consecrate ourselves, set our hearts apart. We need to, to run, to flee from sin and immorality. And we need to flee towards God. I don't understand it. I don't, I don't get how it all works, but I, I know God's word says this impacts our prayers. And so we gotta consider it. We got to consider what are we doing? What, what, what's in our life that we need to, to get rid of? 
What unrepentant sin do I need to repent of today to turn from? What person in my life, maybe in this room, do I need to go and ask forgiveness from? What person do I need to humble myself before and say, listen, I've been, I've been carrying something for far too long and it's, it's, it's due time that I tell you I'm, I'm sorry that I've held that against you. I'm, a, I'm, I'm not going to name any names, but just a few weeks ago, this happened in our church, right? Somebody came up to another person, I'm not going to use he or she's or anything, I want you to try to figure it out. Somebody came up to another person and they said, listen, I've been kind of bitter towards you for a long time because of something that had happened years ago. She said, I want you to know I'm sorry. I want, I want to get past that. I want to restore our relationship. Praise the Lord for that. That's good. That's a sign of maturity on behalf of that person. That's a sign of that person following the Lord and listening to the Lord. Don't be ashamed of that. You think, oh, I can't do that. It's been 20 years. I've been carrying bitterness for 20 years. So you're going to keep carrying it? No. Get rid of that. It's never too late to be the bigger person. It's never too late to repent. So repent today. Forgiveness. Make amends. And if you look at these two, these two points out of the, that one scripture there, the big takeaway is this, is that if we're going to have successful prayer, it requires faith and forgiveness. We've got to believe and we've got to repent. We've got to believe that God can do it and we've got to repent from any unrepentant sin in our life. We've got to ask forgiveness from those we have hurt. We've got to believe that God is capable. So you say, Jeff, listen, man, what if I believe? And what if I am living a holy life right now, Jeff? I'm really doing good. Things are well. And I believe in God, and I believe He can do it. I've addressed all the sin in my life, but my prayers are still not being answered. What then? Well, I'm going to share a point, and then I'm going to jump into a scripture that I believe supports it, okay? Uh, that I, I took it from, actually. My point supports the scripture. Uh, the point is this. Your request might not always be the right request, okay? Sometimes we pray for things we should ought not pray. We pray for whatever, immature, silly things. Um, your request may not always be the right request, but listen, God's answer is always the right answer. He's always going to give you what's best for you may not feel like it's best at the time, right? But he's always going to give you what's best for you. The Bible says all things work out for the good of those who love the Lord. Like, it's important that we understand that. That, that, that our requests, I'm not always going to pray for the right thing, but God's going to hear my prayers, and he's going to answer me. And his answer is not going to be the wrong answer. It's going to be the right answer. Let's look at it, one more passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 7. This is another scripture where Jesus says, tell me, talk to me. Tell me, tell God what's going on in your life. Verse seven of chapter seven. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Those are promises of being heard, right? Ask and they're gonna give you. They're not gonna ignore you. Seek and you're gonna find it. He's not, God's not gonna run from you. Knock and the door's gonna be answered. He's not gonna go, he's not gonna leave. He's gonna answer the door, right? Ask, seek, and knock. There will be a response. Verse 8, for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened. And then he says in verse 9, and at first this maybe doesn't make sense. You're like, well, he kind of changes speeds here. He does, but, but not really. He says, or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or, or if he asks for a fish, he'll give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, that's us, just, just humans, sinfully, nat naturally sinful people. If you guys who are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your kids. Then how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Sometimes I don't get the answer that I want because my request is awry. Sometimes I'm asking for stones and snakes. God's wanting to give me bread and fish, right? But my requests are all over the place because I'm seeing things right here, right now. I don't have the ability to see the future, right? I can make guesses and they're always wrong, right? I don't have the ability to know what's coming down the pike, but God knows all that. He sees it. He sees it all angles, everywhere around. Uh, he knows what's going on. 
and he gives me exactly what I need. He answers my requests, maybe not in the way that, that I asked them, but in better ways, in ways that I wouldn't even have thought to ask. I think about, I think about things like that. I think about, uh, it's coming up in November, and many of you, if you know me, you know my dad passed away almost seven years ago. Um, and I remember when my dad was on the hospital bed, and we went up, and he was unresponsive at this point, and they were going to take him, they took him off the ventilator and life support and everything, and it was just, we're going to wait and see what happens. And I remember being the only one sitting in that room. I stayed the night with my dad um, that last night, and I remember sitting there with him, and I was, I was writing some stuff down, doing some, some journaling, and, and uh, I remember praying that night over my dad, and I prayed for healing. I prayed that God would, you know, do something that only he could get the credit for, that he would do something that would leave everybody in amazement. And I believe that God would receive great glory from, from my dad being healed on that hospital bed. But I remember at the end of my prayer saying, God, whatever gives you the most glory is what I want. Lord, whatever is best for your kingdom is what I want. Lord, whatever is your will is what I want. I didn't get what I prayed for that night. My dad passed away at 4.30 in the morning. Woke up to hear him taking his last breath, and I knew that was it. I still struggle with it today. Hurts. But I, but I know that the Lord has used that in my life to grow me as a man. He's used that in my life for me to connect with other people who are struggling and coping with grief of losing a loved one. He's used that in my life to develop me spiritually, to open up conversations with other people, with my family even, about God and about who he is. God's used that circumstance in better ways than I could have ever imagined it happening. And I don't believe God's done using that yet. He's using it for his glory. And if I look back to Jesus Christ and when he prayed, he gave us such a great example of prayer. And it's in Mark chapter 14. Jesus just goes to show us he knows what is good for us, right? He knows what is good for us. We think we know what's good. Uh, we, don't, we don't know Jack. Jesus knows what is good for us, and, and this is what he says. Listen to his prayer. May it be our prayer. Jesus is praying, and he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. He tells his disciples, hang out. And going a little further, Jesus, he fell on the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible, this hour might pass from him. He's about to be crucified. And so he says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. What Jesus said to God that night is, God, I, Father, I don't want to go through this, man. I, this is going to be bad. It's going to be painful. I'm, I'm worried. I'm scared. He was, he was crying drops. Of, he was sweating drops of blood. I mean, like, he wasn't excited about what was about to go down because he knew it was going to hurt and be painful and hurtful. And so he prayed to God. He said, if there's any way, God, that we could not do this, like if you could, you know, just make everything work and I could just not have to go through this, remove this cup from me, he says. But then Jesus always, he ended his prayer the way that we should end every prayer. God, not my will, but your will be done. This is what I want. These are the desires of my heart. Pray those. Let God know. But always remember that our greatest desire is not what we want. It's what God wants for us. So Jesus said, this is what I want. But God, it's what you want that matters most. When we pray, we tell God our requests. We tell him our desires. We tell him our heart. But we always remember that it's what he wants that matters most. It's what he wants that is best for us. I hope that you believe that today. And I hope that you have the faith to follow him long enough to see that in your own life. We need, to be, we need to be a praying church. We could do a lot of things. Um, we could plan a lot of events. We could, 
you know, tear this church down and build another one. We could do a lot of different things to like try to, to reach our community and to try to be a difference-making church. And I'm not saying those are bad things and, and, you know, I wish the best for those who are doing those things. But what if, okay, what if, church? What if we became a praying church? Not just a church who believed in prayer, but a church that constantly prayed. What did you think about that for a moment? What if we were a church known in our community for being a praying church? A church that took seriously communication with God. A church that met to pray in homes. A church that met to pray at the church. A church that prayed for those who are hurting, for lost souls in our world, for those who are sick. What if we became known as a praying church? What souls in our community, what souls in your family might be saved? What lives might we see changed? What marriages might we see restored? What diseases might we see healed? Church, if we were a church united in prayer, what we would see is ourselves by God's grace and for his glory, to be a powerful and unstoppable force in our community, in our world, not because of anything that we are or what we have done, but only in that we have submitted ourselves to the God of all the universe. We have chosen that communication with him is more important than communication with anybody else, and we have decided that to bring our requests and our prayers, and our concerns, and our worries to God is the absolute best place that we can bring them. Church, what if we became a praying church? Would we be that powerful force, that unstoppable force for the kingdom of God? Church, will we be that church? Will you be that man? Gentlemen? Gentlemen in here today, listen. Will you be that man? Will you be a praying man? Will you be a man that leads your family in prayer? Will you be a man that is unashamed to take things to the Lord, to be dependent on the Lord? Will you be that man? Teach your kids how important prayer is. Be an example to your wife about the difference that prayer makes. Ladies, maybe your maybe your man won't step up. I'm sorry. But that doesn't excuse you from being a faithful prayer warrior. You set the example. Just because he won't step up doesn't mean that. All is lost. It means you got another prayer request. You take it to the Lord. You be that example for your kids. You lead them in the way. Church, we need to be a praying church. We need to be a people who worry less and pray more. We need to be a church who doubts less and prays more. We need to be a people who are quick to pray. Not just quick to tell people we'll pray for them. Anybody can do that. Lots of people do it. But there's a lot less that actually do it. We need to be people who pray with people. I don't care where you're at. Walmart, hospital, parking lot, Dash barbecue. Pray with people. It's okay. It's only weird for other people. It ain't weird for you. You're talking to the God of all the universe, man. (laughs) We need to be a praying church. If we can be a praying church, we'd be a difference-making church. I believe that we are making a difference by the grace of God right now in our community and in the lives of other people. But I believe that we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And I believe the rest of the iceberg is not going to be uncovered until we become a praying church. And we're not going to become a praying church until you become praying people.
until I become a praying person. I'll stand up here and admit before you, and I'm not going to drag this on or belabor it. I'll admit before you that prayer is an area that I struggle with. It's not natural or easy for me. And you think, oh, you're a pastor. Everything spiritual is natural and easy for you. Absolutely not. Couldn't be further from the truth. I struggle with it. It's an area where I have to discipline myself. Uh, and I've been, I, you can ask my wife, I've been reading books and I've been trying all sorts of different things to get better at prayer because I realize how important it is. I hope that today you realize how important it is. I hope that today you'll leave with a renewed commitment to be a person of prayer. And uh, if we're going to be a prayer church, we need to start praying right now. So let's pray. God, thank you for this, this day, and thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that in your word we see these words from Jesus Christ himself, who says that we should ask, that we should bring our requests to you. And Lord, that you will not just hear them, but you'll answer them. And so, Lord, we pray for your will to be done in our church and in our lives. And Lord, we pray that as we bring our requests to you, that you would hear them, you would answer them according to your will. And Lord, we know that you are a good father who gives good gifts. And God, we know that those good gifts are exactly what we need and they're what's best for us. So help them to see us, help us to see them gifts for that. And Lord, we want to give you glory in that. Help us to become a praying church, Lord. May we be a people whose heart is set and focused on prayer, that we wouldn't uh, feel good waking up without starting the day in prayer. We wouldn't feel good going to bed without ending the day with prayer, that we wouldn't feel good worrying or thinking or trying to devise plans without first consulting you in prayer, God, that in all we do in every way and every day, we would take things to you in prayer. And Lord, we pray that you would hear our prayers and you would answer us and you would build your kingdom here on earth for your glory. God, we pray this in your son's name. Amen.